It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Philips 276 E8 VJSB. The OSD is controlled by a small joystick, and that is located at the rear of the screen or the bottom of the screen behind this little Philips tag here. So you can see that just there, that little knobble there poking out, that's the joystick. What I would say when you're using this is it's pretty particular about how it's used. It needs quite a forceful push in the right direction. So it has a kind of indentation where your finger naturally sits and that feels quite comfortable in the center of it. But if you do that, you're likely not to give it enough travel in each direction. And that can mean it doesn't respond to your inputs properly, if at all. Another thing to note is that it doesn't like to be moved diagonally. It doesn't actually respond to any input diagonally. Some joysticks, if you move them diagonally, they'll just count that as a right press or left or up or down. This one tends to just completely ignore the input. So you have to sort of be quite direct and quite firm with your use of the joystick. If you twiddle the joystick to the left, it allows you to access the smart image game presets. The various different presets on this monitor, all these do is change things in the OSD to various different preset values. So there's FPS, which makes things look quite flooded and overly sharp. But you can adjust various different settings with these different presets. So it doesn't lock out different settings. You actually have access to the full complement of picture mode settings, for example. There's racing, RTS, and that does have a specific feature enabled the RTS and I believe the FPS mode has this as well. But you'll notice there's a weird little sort of frame there and that is an area of the screen which has different digital brightness and contrast levels to the rest of the screen. It's designed to sort of highlight, um, in an RTS game it would highlight your, your map or your radar screen or whatever, um, that kind of thing. So you can actually customise the size and position of that. I'll just quickly show you that uh, because it isn't available on some of the other presets. That's called Smart Frame. You can see that setting here. You can change the size of the frame. And you can change the position on the screen as well. And you can set the brightness and contrast levels. It isn't the same as the main brightness control of the monitor. It's just a digital brightness adjustment. It doesn't adjust the backlight itself. Gamer 1 and Gamer 2, so they're sort of really fully customizable. Um, and you can just have them set to various different preferences of yours. I've actually set Gamer 1 up as a low blue light setting, which I use for relaxing evening viewing. Gamer 2 is just set up as default, so it just sort of, again, it just adjusts various different settings and you can just do that manually instead. There's low blue mode, and I'll go through that shortly in the main menu system, or off, which just keeps things Again, set up as you like them manually. If you twiddle the joystick up, you can change the input used by the monitor. You can quickly select HDMI port 1, HDMI port 2 or display port. Twiddle the joystick down and you can quickly adjust the brightness used by the monitor. And if you press the joystick in, nothing happens. Except if you hold it in for a few seconds, that's how you turn the monitor off. Or I should say, more accurately, puts it into active off because it's still using a small amount of power. Um, it's the same as any monitor if you just turn it off using the power button. But that's what happens if you hold the joystick in. Finally, if you twiddle the joystick right, that's how you access the main menu system. So the first setting there is the low blue mode. And this has various different levels, if you like. So the first one is the weakest low blue light setting. The second one is a bit stronger, third stronger again, fourth stronger again. And what these do is they massively reduce the blue color channel. They reduce the blue light output from the display. They change the brightness a bit, but you can manually adjust that further. And if you really want to minimize blue light output from the monitor, you should use the lowest brightness you're comfortable using. And the image does actually look quite green. Um, I know I've got a green background and it won't be obvious on the camera, it's difficult to show colour temperature variation um, on, on videos, but to my eye it certainly no looks a lot greener than the factory defaults, and that's because the green channel isn't reduced, so it's only the blue colour channel that's reduced to, to reduce the blue light output. And 
by leaving the green channel pretty much alone, it maintains strong contrast and doesn't affect your static contrast performance of the monitor. Next is input, so you can just adjust the source used by the monitor. Then there's picture, so that has various different options, brightness, contrast and sharpness adjustment. The sharpness adjustment, 50 is optimal, and most users will want to use that, but I know some users like different settings according to preferences. There's 60, which to my eyes is clearly overly sharp, um, or you can adjust it to 40 if you like a much softer look to the image. And there's various different options beyond that as well. You can set that between 0 and 100 in increments of 10. Smart response. These are the pixel response time settings of the monitor. Various different options there. Off, fast, faster and fastest. I consider faster optimal as noted in the review. Smart contrast. This is a dynamic contrast setting which is mentioned and explored a bit in the written review. Smart frame which I've gone through. That's greyed out in most of the presets including if you've got the smart image game set to off, as I have right now. There are various different gamma settings. 1.8, 2.0, 2.2, 2 2.4, 2.6. These are explored in the written review as well. Pixel orbiting. And this is just a feature which slightly shifts the pixel by one pixel, then back again. Um, just every now and then. I haven't, to be honest, I haven't really noticed it doing this, so it's not something which most users will find bothersome. And all this is designed to do is reduce the chances of getting image retention. This isn't something I noticed on this monitor anyway. Um, but if for whatever reason you notice the slight, very occasional judder, and it really is very occasional, I think it only does it once every few hours perhaps. I don't really know because I haven't noticed it doing it at all. Um, but if it's bothering you, just turn pixel orbiting off and it won't do it. I don't think you should really worry about image retention. Um, on this monitor in general, but Philips monitors, they do have this kind of feature. It's quite a standard feature. Overscan, and that only applies if you're connected to sort of an older system which uses that, um, that kind of thing, like an older games console. Smart size, these are the different scaling behaviors of the monitor, and these apply when you're using a non-native resolution. So I'm just going to quickly set things to the full HD resolution so I can show you what these do. I've got the monitor running in full HD at the moment, so panel size is the default option, and what that does is it'll use all pixels on the screen and the monitor will use an interpolation process, a scaling process, to map the source resolution to its 3840 by 2160 pixels. One to one, that is a pixel mapping feature, one to one pixel mapping. So this only displays 1920 by 1080 pixels and puts a black border around for the rest. And if I change the resolution, as you can see, it's a very small area you get to play with with the uh, full HD resolution, but it's completely undistorted. Now, if I change this to 2560 by 1440, for example, the black border will get smaller, but you still get an undistorted 2560 by 1440 in the centre of the screen. And this aspect, and what this does is it actually just stretches the image vertically, so it uses interpolation vertically, but keeps the 16 by 9 aspect ratio horizontally. I don't know if that's what it's supposed to do, to be honest. I would have thought it would just um, keep the aspect ratio maintained properly without stretching the image. You can clearly see, though, it's completely stretched and looks odd. Uh, so I'm not really sure why it does this and what benefit that is, but I suppose with some resolutions it might make sense. But if you're running a 16 by 9 resolution, I'd use the first option instead so it doesn't look stretched and weird. I'm just going to double check that by setting it to the full HD resolution, seeing what it does there. So again, this looks really stretched um, vertically, but not horizontally. It's a bit of a curious setting, really, then. I'm just going to set it back to the normal native resolution, 3840 by 2160, 4K UHD. And you can see that this setting does actually do something. Um, again, it's, it's still stretched up and looks weird. It's basically just squashed the image, even though I'm running at my full native resolution of this, the screen, so I, I can't really tell you what purpose this particular setting has. There's one-to-one, -one, and because this is 3840 by 2160, that's just exactly the same as using the panel type setting. And the panel size itself, 
and as you will have seen briefly there, there are various different options so it can simulate different panel sizes. So the 27 inch 16 by 9 which is how things should look. If you want to simulate a 24 inch screen you can do that and it does look noticeably softer. It is actually using interpolation here so it doesn't maintain the native sharpness or anything like that completely. Various other settings, let's just go for an extreme one there, 17 inch 5x4. So again, that's because it's 5x4, it's sort of squished up and looks strange. Next, there's PIP, picture in picture, slash PYP, picture by picture. And this allows you to display multiple sources at the same time. It supports two sources simultaneously. So you can have one source, DisplayPort, in my case, because I'm connected using HDMI. If I had something connected to DisplayPort as well, it would be displayed in that little box there towards the top right corner. You can customise that, so you don't have to have it towards the top right on that particular size. You can alternatively have it so that it is a bit bigger or a bit bigger again. You can change the position of it so it's not top right, it can be top left, bottom right, or bottom left as well, if you prefer. Swap will change the input used so it would show HDMI up there and display port for the rest or whatever inputs you might be using. And there is PBP, picture by picture, so that will just give you half of the screen with one input and half with another. And you can see that it doesn't use all of the space because if it did that, as it says, change resolution to 1920 by 2160. So you'd have to use that resolution to avoid having black borders, because if you've got the 3840 by 2160 resolution as displayed here, um, and you're just using a little bit of the screen, it's just gonna sort of compress everything together. You don't want it to just sort of stretch it out vertically because that will start distorting everything. Next there's audio, and that allows you to control the volume or mute anything connected to the 3.5 millimeter audio output. There aren't integrated speakers on this model. There's colour and that allows you to manually adjust the red, green and blue colour channels if you so desire. Or you can use the sRGB emulation mode, sRGB there, and that's explored in the written review. There's colour temperature, 5000K, uh, 5000 Kelvin, that's essentially an alternative low blue light setting. I noted before with the main low blue mode settings that they have a bit of a green cast to them but they maintain the full sort of native contrast of the monitor. This is an alternative setting. It doesn't have that green cast because it reduces the green color channel as well as making the image appear warmer and reducing blue light output. But it does slightly reduce the contrast, but not massively. And I explore this more in the written review. But there are various other options there. 6500K being the default, 7500, 8200, 9300, and 11500. Next is language, which just changes the language that the OSD is displayed in. OSD settings, horizontal and vertical, so you can change the position of the OSD on the screen, horizontally and vertically. There's a transparency effect, which is set to off by default, I believe. Um, you can have a little transparency effect or a more extreme transparency effect if you prefer that kind of look. OSD timeout, that's how long after the last button press or the last twiddle of the joystick before the OSD will automatically disappear. You can just twiddle the joystick left a few times to get rid of the menu manually if you prefer. Finally, there's setup. First thing there, resolution notification. That'll just give you a little notification on the screen if you're not using the native resolution. Display port version, 1.2 for the full capabilities, 1.1 for using an older system that doesn't support 1.2, so that's a compatibility thing. An option to reset everything to the factory defaults. And finally, there's an information section, which just gives you some basic information, such as the model number um, or shortened version of the model number, the serial number, and the current refresh rate and resolution that you're running. So that's really all there is to the Philips 276E8 VJSB. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.